Hello, I'm Diane Wirth. I'm professor of immunology and infectious disease at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And today I'm talking with Dan Hartman of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Dan, welcome. Well, thanks, Diane. It's a pleasure to be here. As director of integrated development, what does that mean in the context of malaria eradication versus product development? So in product development, we are constantly thinking about how to pull all of the different pieces together, um, whether it's a clinical plan, a regulatory strategy, a manufacturing plan, uh, a toxicology plan, thinking about the sequence of these various activities and how to do that in the most efficient, cost-effective way. As I look at all of the research being done in malaria, they tend to be one-off. You know, we're going to answer this question, and then we're going to answer the other question, and then the subsequent mm -hmm. question, and you have a whole bunch of questions being answered. But how do you integrate all of those different results into a cost-effective way to eradicate malaria? How do you think about the combination of various vector control tools? Do I need bed nets and IRS mm -hmm. and, you know, newer vector control um, tools, or can I substitute? And, mm -hmm. and how do you think about that? Well, if I have an effective vector control, do I need to do mass drug administration? Mm -hmm. And in what type of population and in what type of setting, you know, high intensity, low intensity, indoor, outdoor, there's so many different covariates and, and so many pieces of information that I think this is a great opportunity to do model-based global health and try to say what type of an environment am I entering, what type of information do I have, and what is the most cost-effective way to utilize the tools uh, as opposed to just being add-on therapy. So when Bill and Melinda Gates in 2007 announced their, the goal to eradicate malaria, I was in the room and I remember thinking, no, this is, it's too hard. The biology, you know, the transmission is, you know, one case leads to a hundred. Um, and, and then as I thought about it, I realized it was a paradigm shift, right? That now you had to think not about a disease, but actually eradicating a biological organism. And that's a very different thing. And I think that paradigm shift you see reflected now in the research and the implementation. We are now focusing much less on disease. Clearly disease is important, but we're focusing much less on disease than we are on how do we get rid of the organism and its transmission. As I've been working with a team, and, and we fund a fair amount of research, mm -hmm. the, the one question that we always ask is, how will this help us eradicate malaria? Mm -hmm. And, and it's been interesting to, to think through that in the grants that we make and, and yeah. how, how we're approaching all of our work as opposed to, you know, thinking like a physician like I am to, okay, I see a patient, I treat a patient. You've talked a bit about evaluating um, the, the current tools in terms of will they uh, contribute to eradication, but where do you see the holes in the toolbox? Where or where are the missing tools? As I've been looking at and mm -hmm. trying to evaluate the current toolbox, one of the things that I would love to see us develop is something that is less reliant on human behavior. Because I mm -hmm. think human behavior is so difficult to change. And, you know, if we look at, at polio, um, mm -hmm. there is a human behavior required for the eradication of polio. You have human behavior on the part of the vaccinators. They have to go out. They have to find everybody on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, the places that they're challenged most near their, their end game is areas with social strife. Um, and, and in malaria, because of the vector, there may be opportunities to think about a tool that doesn't require one human being interacting with another or one human being mm -hmm. taking a medication for a given period of time. And we know adherence, even in the best situations, right. is, is challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what if we could alter the vector with minimal human behavior? 
it's an interesting idea. You know, it, it gives the opportunity to think in a completely different way, not focus at all on the parasite, but focus on the vector. I, th I think other things that we're looking to do is to reduce the um, reliance on continuous medication for p -Vivax. Can we go from a 14-day regimen to a single dose? Mm -hmm. um, the, the single dose would be, I think, beneficial in multiple different ways, both for, for treatment, uh, because the most common regimen is a BID mm -hmm three days in a row, right. um, what if you could do that in a single day? You know, yeah, what would happen yeah. to resistance? Because mm -hmm. you would be, you know, getting a full dose in a, in a single day, as well as thinking about um, mass drug administration. Mm -hmm. If that's a tool that would help us eradicate malaria, uh, it's a mm -hmm. lot easier to do mass drug administration if you're giving a single dose then maybe you have to come back multiple times. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, I think that also relates to taking the human behavior factor out of it. Good. In fact, one of the challenges as we talk about products, whether it's uh, genetically engineering mosquitoes or it's new drugs or vaccines, one of the big issues is the regulatory issues. How do you take things from discovery and get them uh, approved, particularly in situations where it's a, a new idea. It's not something that the industry uh, has done before or, or rarely does. And I know that you think about this a lot, and I'm, I'm wondering what your perspective is, what the approach will be. One of the things that we try to do and, and are doing more frequently today is integrated development, mm -hmm. of which integrated development includes what is your regulatory strategy. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to plan if you don't know what your end is going to look like. Mm -hmm. So early interactions with regulators, talking to them about new products, what could these products be, what could the endpoints be, and then developing a strategy on how to get there in, in the most effective way. Mm -hmm. Again, remembering that most products fail. Right. So you, if you don't know where you're going and you don't know what the steps are gonna get there, if you do fail, you're likely to fail late as opposed to failing early, mm -hmm. which is a very expensive endeavor. Being able to make a clear case as to why you think a product would be safe and effective or have an appropriate risk benefit in a given situation uh, is, is obviously necessary. Mm -hmm. And then having the, the open discussions with various regulatory agencies. And sometimes I see us thinking more developed world regulatory agencies. Mm -hmm. But what we really need to do is to go to the communities that we work and get their perspectives on risk benefit. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very important point, uh, you know, because it, it is a different population that's going to uptake almost everything that's developed during this phase of, of the elimination eradication campaign. I had a, a fascinating discussion with one of my colleagues from Senegal, mm -hmm. and he was telling me about malaria in the 1990s. And he was the, you know, one of the chief physicians at this hospital in Senegal, and chloroquine resistance hit their area. And he said, you know, I would sign 20 to 50 death certificates a day. Yeah. And I don't have that experience. And a lot of regula regulators in the developed world don't have that experience. So when you start thinking about risk and benefit, uh, unless you yeah. have that perspective exactly. and you've lived in those communities, it's really hard to have that. So that's one of the things that we're starting to do, especially with novel products, is really get out into the communities where they're going to be used and, and get their perspectives early on and, and try to have, you know, whether it's WHO, um, stringent regulatory agencies from developed worlds, national regulatory agencies from countries where it will be uh, utilized eventually, uh, all have that discussion together. We've made some really good progress in that area. Um, we've been working on a project called African um, uh, Regulatory Medicine Harmonization, uh, which, uh, is think, taking a regional approach as a, to a country approach for product introduction.
because most of the countries don't have a very well-developed regulatory uh, agency. There are a few, but for the most part in Africa in particular, other than South Africa, I think, there's relatively little local expertise in country, but from a regional perspective, um, that could be of interest. We're, we're trying to do multiple things with this approach. So one is to get a critical mass, as you were describing, right. so if we can take the East African community, pull their resources and their, and their best people together and have them do like dossier reviews. That, that's a positive mm -hmm. thing. Uh, the way we're, we have it set up right now is we're bringing in other regulators, like whether it's Swiss Medic or folks from WHO or other stringent regulatory mm -hmm. agencies to help answer questions that they might have. And they're also relying on other stringent regulatory agency reviews. So mm -hmm. instead of starting from scratch, they're looking at somebody else's report, ideally, mm -hmm. and saying, okay, do I agree with this report as opposed to having to dig through, through an entire dossier. Mm -hmm. And the whole purpose of that is to make sure you have a quality review and make sure it's timely. But it also benefits manufacturers. If I was a manufacturer and like in my old role, and I wanted to submit a drug to Sub-Saharan Africa, I would have over 50 dossiers that I would have to prepare and submit. Mm -hmm. and get questions back from 50 countries, yeah, right. respond to all 50 for a market with very marginal turn mm -hmm. on that. Well, if we can create a system where we have four or five regional areas and you can drop in four or five dossiers yeah. as opposed to 50, get back four or five sets of questions mm -hmm. um, and, and have a general format that everybody's agreed to, that would dramatically reduce the, the burden uh, on the manufacturers. We did a study about three years ago looking at the time it takes for a product to go through the entire regulatory system and get to people in developing countries. In right. developed countries, it's about nine to 12 months. In developing countries, especially in sub-Saharan sub -Saharan Africa, we found it's about four to seven years. Wow. And it's usually approved in the developed world, goes to WHO for pre-qualification, mm -hmm. then it goes to the national regulatory agencies for their review and approval. Mm -hmm. Frequently, that none of those three groups were taking advantage of prior reviews. So they were doing de novo review each time? De novo review each time, <laughs> and that obviously lengthened it by 3x just if you did that in, mm -hmm. in, in the ideal situation. The other thing that we found is manufacturers, because they had to apply to each country, the, the spread of their submissions of dossiers was sometimes up to four years. Right, because it, it had to fit into their workflow. Right? Exactly. What we're trying to do through this harmonization effort mm -hmm. is to support mutual reliance and, and minimize I would say non-value added activity of applying to each different country as opposed to regions. And mm -hmm. we've had some, some great success in East Africa and, and now this approach and this harmonization effort is moving into West Africa. Right. South Africa already had started something on mm -hmm. their own. At WHO pre-qualification we found that the drug side was relying on stringent regulatory agency reviews but the vaccine side wasn't. And there was about a 13-month difference in review time between drug and vaccines. That was a relatively easy mm -hmm. change to do, um, and, and, and now the timelines are, are much better. Um, looking at mutual reliance of national regulatory agencies right. on, on either WHO or other stringent regulatory agencies' reports has again streamlined it. Um, mm -hmm. single dossiers as opposed to multiple. So all of these things uh, have reduced the overall timelines by close to 50 percent to what they were three years ago. And it also strikes me that there is an enormous capacity building potential here because uh, as as this develops perhaps the Africans will even be able to do standalone approval uh, at the highest level because at some point perhaps that's the right strategy for registering a product 
that's going to be either primarily or only used uh, in, a, in a malaria endemic country. I think that really is where we want to go and the regional approach makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to try to stand up 50 plus you know, high quality regulatory agencies even within the next decade I think would be almost impossible. Exactly, and, and also not productive because malaria is going to have to be solved on a regional level. You know, the disease doesn't know borders. That's something that's becoming accepted as a, as a mode of interaction between countries. What advice would you give to people early in their career or even pre-career? What kinds of things do you think are important for people to think about? I, that's a great question. I. I think that as scientists and physician scientists, we underestimate the importance of leadership training. I went through 15 years of post high school education and 99% of it was science based. The leadership component is a totally different component and, and I think it's one that can be learned. For the last almost 20 years, I read some type of leadership book every quarter. I take time out of my busy schedule to take some type of course that I think will help my career development. Whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, I've taken courses on implementation management, change management, decision quality, uh, a variety of leadership courses. It has really helped my career and helped me understand what good leadership looks like and, mm -hmm. and, and how I can constantly improve myself. I think career development has to start with the individual. Nobody is going to develop your career for you. The sooner I realize that, then I could start taking control over my own career development, understand what some of my areas of weakness were, how am I going to fix those and, and develop. That has made a, a significant difference in, in terms of, of how I think, how I work. Um, mm -hmm. Early on in my career, I think it was less important, but, but today, most of what I try to do is influence my environment. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly, I try to do that through scientific you know, discussions and, and arguments, if you will. But a lot of it is, is I think, some of the softer skills, whether it's an, an emotional intelligence component mm -hmm. or you know, how, how do you think about decision quality. Uh, mm -hmm which is some, something that we tend to overlook. We think we all make great decisions, but you can actually tell, did, did you have a quality process in your decision making at the time you make the decision, irrespective of outcome? Interesting advice, because I agree, we, we don't spend a lot of time teaching people how to lead or, or systematically how to make decisions. We know how to test a scientific hypothesis or follow a protocol, but, but we, don't, we don't focus on how do you get to decisions and how do you lead people to decisions. Well, thank you very much. It was uh, wonder, wonderful that you could spend time with our students. Thank you, Doc.